Hello and welcome to another edition of Book Talk with Jordan and Stefan. So this month we are taking a look at Galapagos by Kurt Vonnegut. And <laughs> this book, you know, this is one another one that I've had on my shelf uh, for a long, long time. And I want to I want to say out front, Kurt Vonnegut is, uh, I think, one of the greatest authors of all time, and I don't say that lightly. I think he is, as far as great American authors go, he is on par with uh, Mark Twain, F. Scott Fitzgerald. He is uh, J.D. Salinger. He is one of the all-time greats of American literature. Um, <clears throat> I uh, wholeheartedly recommend Slaughterhouse-Five. I wholeheartedly recommend um, Cat's Cradle. Those are two of my favorites by him. Uh, certainly Mother Night is amazing, Player Piano is amazing, uh, his short story collection Welcome to the Monkey House has some amazing work in it. Um, that said, there is a strain in Kurt Vonnegut's writing, a thematic strain that I really don't like. It showed up a little bit in Player Piano, and it showed up elsewhere, and uh, it shows up very, very prominently in Galapagos, and it is a kind of uh, condescending misanthropy that is just on, very much on full display here. Galapagos tells the story of a uh, group of people who um, uh, who are stranded at a trop the site of a tropical cruise uh, through the Galapagos Islands, uh, right at the time right at a time of severe international uh, chaos and panic, and the world is breaking down and civilization is crumbling. And these last five people, uh, five, six, um, I say last five people because I'm thinking if I have no mouth and I'm a scream. No, the, this last group of people, um, I forget the exact number of them, uh, end up, you know, seeking refuge on the Galapagos Islands where they are stranded. And, of course, they end up having to restart the human race. And what happens is, and, and understand, I'm not giving anything away because this will talk about the weird plot structure of this book is that it just tells you everything that's going to happen before it does. But what ultimately happens is because these this last group of people are living in this one extremely condensed environmental area over uh, several uh, million years, they eventually... Uh, evolve or de-evolve into these kind of sea lion-like creatures, and that's the new human race. So to give you an idea of what's going on in the story, um, you have it, the whole thing is narrated from the point of view of the son, the ghost of the son of Kilgore Trout. Kilgore Trout is a recurring character in Kurt Vonnegut's novels, uh, who is a, uh, science, a, a uh, kind of failed science fiction author. He shows up in Slaughterhouse-Five. He shows up in a bunch of others. But uh, he's kind of, some people say it's Kurt Vonnegut's uh, version of himself, uh, or a, 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 an avatar for himself. Some say that uh, he's uh, Kilgore Trout is based on Theodore Sturgeon or other authors. But uh, point being that it's the son of Kilgore Trout who uh, died in the making of the boat that they were going to set sail on uh, for this Galapagos cruise. With you know, with that in mind, it's it seems like a, an interesting premise. The problem is he keeps telling you from the beginning, like this is what's going to happen. This will be what happens next, and and so far along down the line that he eventually tells you about this ultimate evolution of the human race long before it ever actually occurs in the narrative. So there's no surprises whatsoever. And when I talk about this negative strain in Kurt Vonnegut's writing, it's that, you know, you have to understand about Vonnegut, he was in World War II, uh, Slaughterhouse-Five, the World War, World War II parts of Slaughterhouse-Five were largely biographical, autobiographical, and uh, he's, you know, he survived World War II, uh, and of course, the a lot of his stuff is written in, with, with particular attention given to uh, the nuclear bomb and nuclear war. And all of that, and so um, bearing that in mind, uh, his stuff has this very cynical, often has this very cynical view of human nature and of intelligence and of human ingenuity and human ability. That ultimately, what we're going to do is just create to the point that we lead to our own destruction, and that will the innovation and brilliance and all that just ultimately lead to our own destruction. And in this book, he keeps talking about 
those human beings with their big brains. And the reason he keeps saying that is because later on, you know, the devolved uh, version of the human race has much smaller brains, so they're not capable of coming up with things like nuclear bombs and wiping out the planet and everybody's living happy. And to me, it's just this extremely negative interpretation of liberal values, you know, that the, the human brain, the human mind is so is so innately corrupt and inevitably uh, evil that the only thing we can do is turn into animals again, and then at least we're living in harmony with the planet, blah, blah, blah. And the whole book, he keeps saying those humans with their, those poor humans with their big brains, with their big brains, with their big brains, and the whole thing just sounds like one big fuck you to the entire human. <laughs> so I, it was... It was not a pleasure at all to read. It was bo- It was tedious, depressing, and insulting. That's what I thought. What did you think, Stefan? Well, yeah, you kind of question him as a satirist because you're trying to figure out what exactly is he, is he satirizing, and you're like, well, there's, there's no individual, there's no, yeah. there's no engine or or company or group that you're saying, okay, this is it. He's talking about in general. So mm-hmm. you're right when he says it's more of a, a cynical attitude towards existence and. Mm-hmm using uh, Darwinism as the ultimate perpetrator to, to explain all this, and he just goes around and, and tells this, this ramshackle story. Because when you think of all these characters, like, wow, look at all these characters, what's going to happen? And then he starts saying, oh, by the way, uh, now that I'm telling you this, every time you see an asterisk, this means this, one, this person's going to die. So don't, don't worry about that. So it's like the narrator is like kind of chiding you on, like, by the way, don't worry about this. I mean, that to me is absolutely crazy and brilliant. For, yeah. a, for a writer to tell their audience, uh, you know, it's kind of like this, if you showed me a manuscript and you're putting notes on the side and it's like <laughs> this common theme throughout, you're like, why do you keep drawing stars all over the place? Oh, don't worry, I'm just keeping track of things. And then you say, no, 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 that's part of the story. You, yeah. you yeah. need to have this symbol in there. It's like it's a literal symbol telling you not to worry about this character because he's going to die. I thought it was absolutely ridiculously crazy. Yeah, and uh, but it works. Like that's the beautiful thing. Like he's trying to tell you that mankind is is totally messed up, and mm-hmm. and it just so happens that uh, these group of people are going to be uh, the saviors or not the saviors, the remnants of of what's left, mm-hmm. and and the evolution, uh, the future evolution of mankind. So there's there is the narrator, which makes no sense because how could this narrator know all these things? Because he's talking to you like he's sitting right next to you, but he's he's going f- so far in the future one time, and then he's talking about the past, and then he's in the back in the present, and the present continues, and you're just like, what's going on? And then halfway through, we find out he tells us he's a ghost, and then he has a little conflict being a ghost. You're like, what? That's another story. And it's just keep, it's just this jumping around. And natu- normally, when you think of a, of a story with the main character, you'd say, this is ridiculous. I can't follow this. There's all these time jumps. There's all these characters. Some are ghosts. Some are, are being evolving millions of years in the future. It's like this is insane, mm-hmm. but but then you realize that's the point. You want to show that humanity is is uh, kind of crazy. So I kind of had the opposite effect where I started off going, "What the heck am I reading? Why are there so many characters? Why is there a a Japanese inventor and then there's this mm-hmm. crazy guy who wants to have a nature cruise and and then and then it, like then I get it and then it just keeps going with it. You're like, okay, fine, I can mm-hmm. I can now play with it. So. The idea behind him uh, disliking humanity, because uh, this is my first book by Vonnegut, so I wasn't sure what to expect. So, oh, wow. so when he's when people say he's a satirist, I'm like, okay, well, I, I get the tone, like he's trying to poke fun and 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 you know downplay these characters, but it's like, well, it's nothing, it's no one specific. It's just in general, the fact that humanity is the way they are, and uh, that's that's the thing he's sort of being cynical about. So. Uh, in that regard to storytelling, I would actually put him on the same level of, of a checkoff in terms of what he has done and the rules he has broken and still able to maintain a narrative, I think is amazing. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, like I said, even in that, I mean, Vonnegut is a, Vonnegut's a stylist par excellence, you know, and you talk about the skipping around and the timeline, that's a huge theme in Slaughterhouse Five, which I consider, I and many consider to be his magnum opus. Uh, Actually, I uh, so I did not know Stefan that this was your only uh, your first Vonnegut. Had I known that, I would have actually said, "Well, we should do Slaughterhouse Five or Cat's Cradle, uh, one of those, or Mother Night." Um, but uh, the uh, but this yeah this one uh, 
this this one to me again it was like you you get in in, in a book like Slaughterhouse Five to use to use a, to build on the idea of the asterisks marking people who die that kind of stylistic device um, in Slaughterhouse Five there is a uh, a uh, he has a, a I don't want to say trope, but he has a method that he uses there where every time somebody dies, he says, so it goes. And that became kind of like when Kurt Vonnegut actually died, of course, all of his, the obituaries the world over said, so it goes, you know, and they, everybody played into it. Um, but that that's a, a, good, a good structural device for marking the deaths like that and marking and kind of uh, poignantly, you know, putting this kind of bittersweet bullseye on the the frailty and the uh, the frailty and the emptiness of uh, uh, you know of a lot of human existence and how much uh, value we put in something that's so transitory. There it works, especially because you know he'll talk about one person that dies and says so it goes, then he'll talk about millions of people that die and say so it goes back and forth. It works there. The asterisks again. It was just it was a similar. Uh, it, it, it was it was a similar idea uh, to me. Not you know, at being a more experienced Vonnegut reader, it was not quite as effective. Um, but again, it's the the whole thing, the the bitterness of it and the misanthropy of it. Normally in Vonnegut's writing, there is there are characters that kind of you you feel like the heroic characters are the ones that kind of like learn to, uh, you know, learn to enjoy crack cracking open a beer and watching the world burn. You know, there's there's a sense of uh, moral, uh, the, the, the real moral righteousness is in the people who can kind of accept that the human race is on, in, in extreme decline and, uh, you know, we can kind of be happy in the moment and just, you know, be kind of blasé, kind of laissez-faire about uh, our feelings as, as the world burns around us, you know. There, as, as weird and cynical as that sounds, that is kind of ultimately what makes his, uh, his writing work. Um, and that did not seem to be quite as on display here, where, you know, because we have this, the, 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 the human race ultimately de-evolves. Uh, and, and incidentally, part of the reason it de-evolves is because one of the people that's stranded on the island is, has uh, mutated genetics from being uh, born in the aftermath of the mushroom cloud. And um, so the, uh, you know, kind of the human race de-evolves. So there's nobody you could you could say it's the, the ghost character, maybe, but there's nobody there. It, it's kind of it's not, it's kind of like saying we can't even have this enlightened, you know, kind of. Uh, the, these kind of enlightened peripatetic philosopher types that Kurt Vonnegut cherishes and idolizes or, or respects, we can't even have those people to sit there and watch the world burn uh, <clears throat> and kind of en you know kind of enjoy it with this detached, sarcastic, uh, jovial cynicism. We can't even have that. We can't even have that satisfaction. We've just got to you know say fuck it and cancel the whole thing well, so the funny thing about that is yes to humanity you would say the intellectual capacity for humanity what happens to the end but we always have the lobsters and they evolve just fine so no. uh, that that was the, the funniest thing as soon as i saw lobsters I'm like you gotta be kidding me <laughs> the lobsters start started making movies and they have like a, a downtown manhattan and he just like alludes to it it's like yeah well, well <laughs> That's, well, that was a theme. That's it's funny. Now, you, now this is interesting. That's actually a theme that I think was also ex the kind of the inevitability that was explored in um, player piano, which uh, in player piano the idea is that we uh, it's, it's a dystopian Orwellian future where uh, everything is fully automated. So you human beings are want for nothing, and uh, we're, we're it's a post scarcity society. And uh, everything is so fully automated that no one actually has to do anything. Uh, and the, the few people that have jobs like the, the, are the rich elite 1% who are essentially glorified repairman, repairmen who keep the, the machines operating. Um, and hence the, the name. And the idea in that is, you know, a player piano can play the notes perfectly, but it can't substitute the human touch of the, the humanity aspect of it. And in that one, 
they succeed, the rebels succeed in tearing down the automated society so that we're back to kind of, you know, um, as, as if, you know, we're almost back to almost like an Amish level society. But then what inevitably starts happening is once we're back to that point, people start building up, you know, the human ingenuity kicks in again and it inevitably comes back around, you know, as, um, it, it inevitably comes back around as, uh, you know, technology on the rise again. So, I think they're, you're right. I mean, that's another thing that comes up in Vonnegut's writing is a sense of, like, inevitability that no matter, you know, it, the, this this process is, is going to continue. And, I mean, it's, it's weird. You could re- interpret that a couple of different ways. You could interpret it as... Um, you know, we're we're going to uh, you know that that the the uh, the the great the great misanthropy of human existence is inevitably going to be realized, or you could interpret it in a a hopeful way. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he is they are clearly saying, well, you know, it's the if not the human race, then something else will evolve up, and it's kind of one of those um, turtles all the way down kind of things, like uh, you know. We, you know, if, if we we evolved up from the chimps, you know, how do we know something else didn't evolve up from something else before us and destroy everything? And we came back and up and back and up and back, you know, ad nauseum through uh, billions and billions of years of evolution. So it's an interesting idea. Uh, any further thoughts on it? Yeah, I thought the the characterization of every single, uh, well, not every single character. There was some side characters that just popped in for the sake of it to mm-hmm. to create tension or conflict. But all the characters he introduced had one major flaw, one major conflict, and it was just like, there they are, boom, next person. Because he was writing so tightly and so quickly that it, when the, the next chapter would pop in and then it would be a continuation of the previous or it would be, would be a time jump or it would be, uh, I don't know, uh, some, you know, some past experience that was being uh, retold. And it, it's just, like, I'm trying to imagine how you would, you would do this. Um, Practically, I guess you could do like a Wes Anderson film that you know things yeah. are things are just like jumping so quickly, and then there's so there's these really quirky people, and then one guy gets punched in the face, and the other mm. guy, uh, you know, stages a coup, and then oh, there's all these people running around, and they have like these weird names like Adolf, and and mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's like okay, this is this is pretty farcical, and then you realize oh, yeah. this isn't a farce. This is you know, this is what he he's looking uh, at at the world mm-hmm. and and saying that this is what's going on. So the, the concept behind that the, this random boat mm-hmm. just happened to avoid uh, the destruction of the world is pretty implausible. Even though yeah. they were they were you know, they were there were things happening on the shore before they took off. So that sort of uh, event was like that was probably the hardest thing for me to grasp. Aside from how the narrator knows all these things, because if you have a narrator, you think of just an omniscient storyteller as opposed to hi, I'm, yeah. I'm uh, uh, Leon or whatever his name was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those are the only two major uh, things that made my brain go, wait a second. But other than that, characterization was fantastic. Uh, yeah. it, it was entertaining. It was, this is a good read. Like I, I totally recommend reading this book, even if uh, you didn't like any of his other books. Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, this is like if, if a writer were to write a book and he wanted me to, just, just, to, just for the sake for me, like it's a writer's, writer's book it's just it just feels like this is a guy who knows what the hell he's doing yeah and he wants to impress <laughs> like asimov or someone else like hey what do you think of this that's yeah. what it, it felt like because it was so uh it was so entertaining and so not what you would expect from from a, a typical novel and uh, it was very refreshing and i, I totally recommend it yeah I would, I mean, part of this, may, maybe I, I went into it with the wrong mindset. Like I said, I certainly can't, um, I certainly can't fault, Va- fault, Va- fault Vonnegut as a, uh, a writer on the whole. Uh, I think, like I said, I think he's absolutely brilliant. And, uh, you know, pretty much this is really the first book I've ever read by him that I did not like. Uh, the rest, like I said, I would, you know, go... I would tell someone, dive head over heels into Slaughterhouse Five, dive head over heels into Cat's Cradle. Uh, you will get in either one of those. You will get a much, much better distillation of Vonnegut's ideas and worldviews than I think you do in this. 
Uh, you know, that said, I mean, there were moments that I did like. There's there's one moment, there's a flashback where um, the uh, the ghost character, the son of Kilgore Trout, is asking his parents about the uh, their family lineage, and he goes and asks his mother about, you know, and she tells him about all of the stories about his grandparents and grand, you know, and, and the... Um, uh, you know, grand great grandparents and you know ancestors all the way back and all these great stories. And then he goes and asks his father, Kilgore Trout, and uh, his father says, "Son, you are descended. Was it you are descended from a long line of fast swimming tadpoles? Champions, every one." You know, that lines like that. That's Vonnegut's uh, sense of humor, and that at, at his very best. You know, there's there's a famous story about Vonnegut. Uh, that he went, he worked for one day as a journalist at Sports Illustrated, and uh, they assigned the first story they gave him was a um, uh, a story. He was supposed to write a story about a horse race where one of the horses had jumped over the fence at the um, at, at the racetrack and run off. And he was supposed to write a story about this. And he sat there and stared at the typewriter for like four hours, and then wrote. And then he wrote, the horse jumped over the damn fence and got up and left. <laughs> you know, so that's, yeah, <laughs> that, that's Vonnegut. So anyway, this one I would not recommend unless you've read uh, his greater works. Uh, like I said, it's, it's still, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it, it's, it's a personal B minus for a writer that uh, for me has done nothing else but A pluses. Uh, so, but, you know, obviously Stefan, uh, going into it got a lot out of it so uh take that for what it's worth uh i think that about covers it though for this book so uh for stefan diorio i'm jordan owen thank you for joining us on book talk join us next time on book talk when our book will be usurper of the sun by hosuke nojiri <laughs>